Mel and his father used drag saws when feasible, but felled many a tree with crosscut saws and axes. Lars began as a straight hand faller, using equipment that had not changed to any great degree for a century or more. Lots of men fall timber for a living. We all began as greenhorns at one time. So most of us are naturally forgiven when our buckers are hung up most of the time. You hear that old familiar sound. Is this old rotten stump one that you fell back in the 50s by any chance? It sure is. I maybe didn't run the saw, but my partner and I cut it. And one of us worked on the motor end, which are big. They weighed about 70 pounds, some of them 90 pounds. And the other guy worked on what we call the stinger end, where the roller was. And we, we fell this tree in the 1950s. And we done a, we got an awful lot of big trees in here, but the, uh, the lumber company we worked for was real concerned about reproduction. And uh, it has turned out real good. And these trees right behind us here were too small. You gotta fall this one first, Mark? I'm gonna fall this one first, and I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna plumb it. In fact, this axe, we, our axe is used as a plumb bob. And we, can, we have to look at the tree, see which way it leans first before we try to fall it. It leans that way. We also have to check the side lean. It's a very good idea to be checking the lean before you ever start in. And I have a double bit axe too that I use uh, quite a bit. And I can use that for plumb bob too or else I can use it to, as a sight. We have a sight on our saw but it isn't as accurate as a double bit axe. I'm going to plumb that again to be sure that it leans down the way I want it to go. It does. Oh. <laughs> that reminds me of kind of a funny thing that happened years ago. My partner and I was falling the timber that when they straightened the highway between Arnold and the Alpine County line, and the, the outfit I worked for, Limeball Logging, had the contract to take the trees out. And we was working right beside the road. And there was people that stopped and watched us, and we had to be so careful that we didn't let a tree go across the road. And I was plumbing this big yellow pine like this, you know, and I was looking at it, and I heard a woman say to her husband, what's that man smelling of his ax for? <laughs> and my partner, got, partner and I got so tickled, <laughs> we couldn't help but laugh. <laughs> well, any longer? <laughs> I got some more to tell about Tom. <laughs> I, I'll, be, I'll be real quick. I'll get going. Uh, Tom and I became real good friends, and I think that he saved all the sweet jokes he heard to tell me. Because the next time I saw him, he said, Lars, he said, do you know how to get a one-armed Swede out of a tree? And I said, no, I don't know. He said, all you got to do is wave at him. <laughs> Lars Sanders was born August 23, 1920, in northern Minnesota in this log house, which had formerly been a lumber company's bunkhouse. Lars' parents owned the home, which was on 80 acres. Lars was the second youngest of seven boys and a girl. His father and older brothers were timber cutters. In their spare time, besides farming chores, they built a new house, which the family moved into when Lars was three. Typical of rural living at the time, the home had no plumbing or electricity. There was an outdoor toilet, a well for water, wood-burning cook stove and heaters, and kerosene lanterns. School was a one-and-a-half-mile walk. 
Not a great distance by 1920s rural standards, but Minnesota winters can be chilly. After school and depending on the season, there was hunting, fishing, and swimming after the chores were done. This was no hobby farm. Family effort produced almost all the food. So Lars, when you were a young boy in Minnesota, did you go swimming? Did you get to go swimming quite a bit in the summertime? Well, we had a nice swimming pool in the corner of the creek, about three quarters of a mile from home. And we did really a lot to go swimming, but my dad, even if he was out working, well, he, he gave his instructions that before we could go swimming, we had to hold so much of a garden. Because we had a big garden, it was at least an acre. Because we depended on vegetables for our whole, our whole year, you know. So we had to, we had to carry, uh, hold those two rows each. My brother Sigurd and I, and sometimes my sister Anna. And then we'd go swimming. Out the trouble was, and then that would be afternoon by that time, and the weather was pretty hot. And the time we got home from swimming, while we were just as hot and sweaty as when we'd be home in the garden. But you'd still go the next day anyway. And we'd still go. <laughs> and then, of course, we helped, uh, we helped my, my, our mother can the vegetables, because she had to can about or well, anywhere from 350 to 400 quarts of vegetables, wild fruit, wild berries, and uh, deer meat, vegetable, uh, deer meat and uh, partridge and rabbit we can. So we, we'd have that to eat in the wintertime. So at the... You didn't go to the store too much to buy um, vegetables and meat, I don't imagine. No, the only thing that we ever had to go to the store for was was salt and pepper and flour and, and stuff like that, you know. Lars liked to go with his dad on the trap line into the woods. Well, whenever I could, like, especially on a Saturday, and I used to go with him, with him when he checked his trap line in the wintertime, and in the summer and the fall, Whenever he'd go berry picking, wild berries and wild fruit, I'd like to go with him. And uh, so especially like to go with him in the woods when he's cutting the spruce pulp. And uh, I was about probably eight years old. I went with him one time on a Saturday, and we had about two and a half, two or two and a half miles to walk. And when we got there, and he started cutting, the spruce, well, I wanted to help him. So he always had an extra axe with him, a small axe, like a cruiser's axe. And he said, well, go ahead. He said, you can help me, but he said, be sure and do a good job so I don't have to do it over. And the axe was sharp as a razor. He always kept his axes sharp. And it wasn't long till the axe slipped and I cut myself in the calf of my leg. And I didn't want to tell him because I didn't want to have to quit, and when my shoe got full of blood, well, I finally had to tell him. And uh, he came and, and bandaged it up, and as he was bandaging it up, he said, now, he said, you got the, Buddha, the sap of the spruce tree in your blood, and you'll never, never get out of the woods. And I guess it was right, because I've been in the woods all my life. When Lars was 10 years old, his father was stricken with cancer, dying three years later at the age of 63. Lars learned to handle horses at an early age, which led to his first paid job in the woods. At 18, he skidded logs with a horse team. Lars had cut down many trees for the use of family and neighbors, but his timber cutting career really began the next year, the 1939-1940 season. He felled trees for a pulp mill located in International Falls, Minnesota. The first job that I ever earned money on, got a paycheck on, was skidding logs with a big team of draft horses for the federal government on the Red Lake Indian Reservation, about eight or ten miles from home. And I lived at the camp and ate at the cookhouse, and I got $40 a month board and room. And the next year, see, that was in 1937, I was just 17, the next year, in 1938, 
I went to uh, cutting timber, cut, uh, cutting for a big pulpwood uh, uh, mill up in International Falls. And I averaged that winter, I averaged $7 a day. And at the very same time, to compare it, my mechanics and electricians uh, made about $5 a day. And nowadays, those same mechanics or mechanics and electricians is making more, way more money than uh, farmers. When the United States entered World War II in 1941, those of Lars' brothers who did not have families were soon drafted. Lars stayed home for the next couple of years, taking care of his mother and the farm. His mother died in January of 1943 at the age of 63. Wanting to see a little of the world before the inevitable draft call, Lars moved to California and went to work setting chokers for the McLeod River Lumber Company. He was drafted into the Army a few months later in May 1943. In March of 1944, he arrived at the Anzio Beachhead, assigned to the 1st Armored Division of the 5th Army. In May of 1944, the Allied forces, which had been stalled for months, mounted a bloody offensive against stubborn German resistance in an effort to liberate Rome. Lars took a hit in the right leg from a German machine gun. The wound was not life-threatening initially, but due to so many other more seriously injured soldiers getting medical attention first, Lars contracted blood poisoning and was out of action for about four months. After Lars returned to his unit, they were involved in some blistering firefights. For his actions, Lars was awarded the Bronze Star. Well, really, we were just like brothers. And uh, we, I didn't want to leave them in any way, shape, or form if I possibly could. Like, I was away for four months when I got wounded the first time, and uh, they didn't believe I'd ever come back, but I did. And they were so glad to see me. And it, it, we were just like brothers all the time. Lars celebrated Thanksgiving Day, 1945, on a troop ship headed home. When I got back from the Army, I spent a little time in my, my old home area in Minnesota, and then I came back here to McLeod, and I still had my job here, and I went to set and chokers again. I didn't work but about probably three weeks up in chokers, and then I decided to go fall in timber with my brother, Charlie, and uh, he was falling timber with hand tools. And uh, on the 4th of July, I had uh, about seven days off, and I went up to Oregon, and, and uh, my girlfriend that I was engaged to when I went to the Army, Rena, labor. We got married up there in, in uh, the Dells, Oregon. And I didn't have a car at that time. So I called Charlie, my brother, and I said, come and get me <laughs> and I'll pay the bill. <laughs> so he came up there and they had a nice trip up there to come and get us. And we got down there by the end of the seven days while we were back and we rented a house and in uh, the camp number two at Pondosa. And uh, it was a nice little two bedroom cabin with a refrigerator in it um, and a wood stove, heating stove and a wood uh, cook stove and a wood uh, water heater stove. And uh, we paid $11 a month rent and that included the water and the uh, and uh, electricity. Lars explains hand falling techniques for the following segment. Some fallers cut the bottom part of their undercut with the handsaw, and then, but they always had to chop out the slope with the axe because saws didn't cut at an angle. My brother and I never did like to cut the bottom part of the undercut because it dulled our saw before the end of the day. Those fallers are chopping the bark off where they're going to make the back cut. 
And the reason they do that, they save the edge of the saw. It doesn't get so dull from the dirt and the tough bark. And that's kerosene they're putting on the saw. They each have a bottle of kerosene that's got a hook on it, and they can hook it right up on the side of the tree. And they've got to, it depends on the pitch that's in the tree, but they've got to put kerosene on there quite often. They're standing on springboards there, and uh, it makes it easier to saw with the hand saw because the higher you up from the stump, the better the saw cuts. <clears throat> That is not the front side, that's the back side of the tree, and it'll soon go. But you could see how much kerosene they had to put on the saw. My brother and I done the same thing. There it goes. Now they're out there limbing and marking it. If the limbs aren't too big, they do it all with an ax, but some of the limbs are so big that they take the buck and saw or the falling saw and cut the, some of the limbs off. But right now he's, he oiled his saw and he's making a, a log. Mars and Rena moved to the coast for the 1947 logging season because he had heard that gasoline power saws were replacing hand saws in the Redwood region. Lars had seen an electric-powered chainsaw in action at McLeod and was convinced that the hand-falling era was ending. There it goes. By 1936, big, powerful, and heavy machines had relieved man of much of the back-breaking labor of the animal logging era. But most timber cutting was still done with saws and axes. There were big, powerful, and heavy saws available, but the falling crew needed a cutting tool that they could carry. The days of power saws, light enough, powerful enough, and reliable enough to replace hand saws were just dawning. Saws powered by steam, compressed air, electricity, and gasoline had been tried with limited success at best. Compressed air and steam were powerful enough but the size and weight of air compressors and steam boilers made them impractical in most cases. Electric chainsaws dated from around 1920 and were reliable, but heavy, and required a powerful generator and long extension cords. When I came over from the coast, I guess I told you that I first went to work for Doc Linebaugh lemon, with a lemon, so, a lemon axe. But it wasn't too long till I went to work on the falling crew and we had electric saw like this. The bar wasn't as long as this, but it was about a six foot bar. This one must be seven, I would think. I haven't measured it. And we had four man crew. And this saw must have weighed close to 100 pounds. I don't remember, but it was close to 100 pounds or maybe a little bit more. And two of us take, took turns falling timber with this end and the other fellow would run the little end there and then we had a man that knocked out the undercut, pounded the wedges and then we had a man that took care of the power line, the, the electric line from the generator. In this one that we worked with here for Doc Lineball, it had a, a generator mounted on a weapons carrier. It had a six-wheel drive weapons carrier, and we could just about go anywhere in the woods with it. And it had up to 1,400 feet of line. It had 14 lines, 100 feet long, and it was up to that fourth man to keep those lines hooked up and out of the way for the timber falling so we didn't hit the lines with the timber. And it's... Uh, this was a good saw. The electric saw was a good saw, actually. But after you got over a thousand feet away, well, then the power cut down. And the best power was up to about 500 feet away, really. Drag saws had been used since around the turn of the century. Their weight had dropped from around 300 pounds to less than 100. And they'd gotten more powerful as well. 
but they were awkward to handle, temperamental, and 100 pounds, not counting a few saw blades of varying length to fit different sized trees, did not feel featherweight on a steep hillside. For falling trees, there was the additional hassle of hanging them on the tree. They were popular in the Redwood region where there were many big trees. For smaller timber, and particularly so on steep ground, hand falling was easier and faster. By the late 1940s, they were as outdated as a Model T Ford. Regardless of the type of saw used for cutting wood, it must do two things. It must cut, of course, but it must also clear the cut of sawdust to prevent the blade from binding. The drag saw gets rid of sawdust through the rise and fall of its blade. The oscillating motion raises the blade when it moves forward, pushing sawdust out of the far side of the cut. The blade lowers when it moves back, pulling the sawdust out of the near side cut. The engine runs on just one side as the gas tank must be above the carburetor. Therefore, when sawing the opposite side of the tree, the blade is reversed. In order to retain the proper oscillation sequence, the engine must run either clockwise or counterclockwise. Direction of rotation is controlled by the ignition timing lever. A patent for a relatively lightweight gasoline engine chainsaw dates back to 1918. But it was not until the mid-1930s that the machines improved enough to warrant serious consideration. There were big problems to overcome. One being that many old timers despised them. Some feared that their jobs were in jeopardy. Others thought the saws were dangerous to operate. They knew that the machines were heavy, noisy, and unreliable. In one 1939 trial, the saws were broken down about half the time. They kept getting better, however. Bloedel, Stewart, and Welch Limited, a major Canadian lumber producer and pioneer since the mid-1930s in the use of gasoline chainsaws, found in a 1949 study, quote, power saw labor produces almost 50% more per man per day than hand fallers, end quote. So by 1949, modern technology had produced a better way to fall trees, but not as much better as this early ad implies. Initially, the chainsaws were used only for falling. And even after buckers started using them, hand saws were often used for finishing the cut because on a hillside, a log might roll and damage the stinger of something or crush the downhill logger. Once manufacturers redesigned the bar so that the saw could be operated without the stinger, one man did the bucking. Today, chainsaws with stingers are only found in museums. The Mercury Distin is considered the best early power saw by many old timers, but was heavy at approximately 110 pounds with six foot bar and chain. For some years, chainsaws had the automotive style float type carburetor, a design which would not allow the engines to run at extreme angles, such as on their side. For falling trees, the bar rotated. When I first went to the coast from McLeod River, uh, this is the first saw that I owned for I started cutting redwood, and I had never owned a power saw of any kind. This is a, called a Mercury Distant, and it's got the, it's the wrong color, and that's, I think it came from the Army. It was an Army-owned saw, because ours were all red, and this one has got a different color completely. But it was, it was a job handling it. This is the clutch. You, you hold, get the lever, get the gas lever up here, get to a certain speed, and then you raise the clutch, put it in gear. When the smaller pistol grip saws were introduced, they still had the float type carburetor. On most, the power head, bar, and chain could be rotated to any position, while the pistol grip, carburetor, and fuel tank remained upright. Arnie Overholzer of Sonora, California, collects early chainsaws and knows this. But for photographic purposes, we asked him to rotate the carburetor 360 degrees. In 1949, McCulloch, a newcomer to chainsaw manufacture, introduced two outstanding units, the Mac 325 and 549. There were many improvements, but weight reduction and the run in any position diaphragm type carburetor added greatly to the power saw's versatility. The 325 produced three horsepower and weighed 25 pounds. A one-man saw with a pistol grip, it was good in smaller timber and made limbing a cinch. 
The Mac 549 had five horsepower and weighed 49 pounds. It had handlebars and could be equipped with a stinger for a two-man operation, or handled by one good man. These saws were very successful, and competitors had to scurry back to the drawing board or get out of the business, which may have been a smart move in some cases, such as this maker, who used a 250cc English motorcycle engine with spark sporadically provided by Lucas, the infamous Prince of Darkness. Lars used McCulloch saws for many years. Yeah, this uh, McCulloch 99 was our favorite saw for many years after we got through using the, we're trying out the Titan and, and uh, Mercury Distant. And this one still had to be, you release the lever right here and then you could either reach down and turn it for falling a tree, and when you're done fall, falling the tree, why well, you could release that and turn it back up. Or if you had the stinger on the end of the long bar, why well, your partner could handle that. But it, they were definitely a good saw, and we, we stayed with them for about, I'm sure they were our favorite saw for about 10 or 12 years. In the early saws, power was transferred from the engine to the chain through a gearbox. In 1953, IEL, a Canadian sawmaker, was first with the next major advance, direct drive. With direct drive, a centrifugal clutch transferred power directly off the crankshaft to the chain. This simple design reduced bulk, weight, and cost, and rapidly became standard on most saws. A few large saws retained gear drive for many years. Oral Whitlow and Mel exhibit and demonstrate over half a century's worth of timber cutting equipment at various public events. The following footage was taken by Mel's wife, Carlene, during the Willits, California annual Pioneer Days in September of 1998. The drag saw is a little woodsman, rated at five horsepower at around 1,500 RPMs and weighing 96 pounds without the blade. Mel's chainsaw is a Husqvarna 371 XP, five and four tenths horsepower, at 13,500 RPMs, weighing in at approximately 16 pounds with bar and chain. Both are two-cycle engines running on an oil and gas mix. The two-cycle Mercury Distant is rated at six horsepower at 4,000 RPM and weighs 110 pounds with bar and chain. If horsepower ratings were everything, it would be a close match. But in performance, there is no contest. The high revving new saw spins the chain much faster and in combination with vastly better chain produces remarkably fast cuts. Looking at the chain on this saw, and that's the first chain that I ever had anything to do with, to sharpening it. But it takes so long to sharpen it. I had to bring it home every night because my partner didn't know anything about sharpening it. And they had to all be sharpened this way, and this way, and this way, and, and even the raker in the middle had to be sharpened and they had to be set with a wrench. In other words, they had to be set like you used to set the hand saws. And if you got it too far out, well, then you'd break the chain, when you'd break the tooth out. So it was really a, a hassle to sharpen them. And I used to spend at least two hours every evening sharpening that s chain in the shop there where I lived in, over in Humboldt County by Arcadia. But they cut good when they were sharpened right, they cut good. But they wouldn't last as long as the, the saws nowadays. When they got half worn out, well, you had to quit. You had to throw them away. And the other saws that we have nowadays, you could, could wear them down to nothing almost. Uh, anyway, and this saw here is uh, the, the 371 Husky, which uh, we started with uh, misery whips to chisel bits, so we're running a chisel chain on here. And uh, it's a cutting son of a gun. Most everybody that's in the, uh, what can I say, uh, in the professional line, uh, 
uses a chisel chain in this day and time. Uh, let's put it this way, and also for the professional follower, I normally use the, uh, you just sharpen with a chisel file. Uh, if you're using, running it on the landing or something where you're sharpening it uh, quite a bit and getting it dull, well, you just go ahead and, and you can sharpen it with a round file. Well, our age would be impossible. Yeah, it probably would. We'd never last long enough to find that. No. <laughs> and in fact, the matter is, I'd probably say that uh, we're, we're going directly against a pretty heavy lean, pulling it. And other than that, we'd probably start figuring out maybe to have crossed it across the side of the hill or something yeah, if we're, if we're, if we're, if we're hand wedging it. <laughs> yeah, we probably wouldn't be falling this way. We'd probably be going out here somewhere. It'd just be too much work to wedge it up the hill. Yeah, right, yeah. Jack Tilson started cutting timber on the family ranch near Redcrest, California, when he was 11 years old. In 1947, at age 18, he became the youngest head faller ever hired by the Pacific Lumber Company at Scotia, California. As a head faller, he was responsible for getting giant and fragile redwood trees on the ground without breaking them into little pieces. Now that's what we use it. Bigger than it. Yeah, but was that big? Peterson drag shop. Okay. Made in Fortuna. Called him Newberg. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I worked there till in 48, I bought a chainsaw. Yeah, yeah, well, that's yeah. The last time I run one, August of '48. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> well, a long time ago. Yeah, well, it's, I'm kind of the same 50 way. Years ago. Yeah, well, it was about fifty years. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. When I was about sixteen, when I was running these things, you know, and no. but it wasn't. But a couple of years later, then they come with the chainsaws, and, and we just kind of set these aside. I was nineteen when I quit using them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What was your first chainsaw, Jack? Oh, it was a Titan. E.R. Titan. About in 1948. It was the first chainsaw PL. Yeah, was that the twin was that the yeah. twin cylinder? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well uh the, to start. The, well the first one I had was a was a forty was a Mercury with the with the, the twin cylinder. Yeah. Yeah. Well yeah. I tried to measure that right after that. Yeah, yeah. I had that tight. But they were they were both good saws. Five to seven foot bar. Yeah, right, yeah. Eight hundred and thirty five pounds. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Thought it was real life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if everything went right, Jack. What do you think uh, for uh, for following this by hand? Oh, by hand. Oh, that's better part of a day. Yeah, that's what I just told him. Gonna have to wedge it. Yeah, well, that's what I just you told him. Put the back in first. Right. Right. Put all the wedges in the back first. Right. Yeah, and that's what I pound a little bit. You chop in front. You pound a little bit. Chop, chop right? right. That's right. No edge. So, well, I, just what I just said. It'd be better. Uh, you'd be very fortunate if you did. If you fell this in a half a day by hand. Oh, I think you're And it, yeah, that's what I was going to say. And about what size tree do we have here, gents? Oh, it's about. I don't know. That way it must be what six foot. I'd say it's a good. I'd say a good six foot. Yeah, I'd say it's a full six foot. Usually they figure an eight foot day a tree is too good hand for to cut it in a day. But lean back bad and they got a wedge side. Yeah, if you've got to start wedging, then uh, it's hard to say. Because the longer you wedge, the tired you get, and you take right. turns beating on them wedges. Well, say we didn't have the wedging problem, though, um, about so that would, that would be the better part of the day still with this tree if you didn't have to wedge it yeah. strongly over? Yeah, it's, uh, ah. uh, it's, if it leaned ahead as much as it leans that way. I would say about four hours, two hand pullers could call it. Yeah, so right. It's going to break a foot and a half of wood if it goes that way. That makes a lot of difference. The foot and a half you don't have to saw. <laughs> <laughs> but that way, a lot of difference. Yeah. Yeah, if you're pulling the tree with a the lean, why, then there's uh, then it, it goes pretty quick. And if, you're, if you've got to fight it, so to speak, or wedge it, why, then it's just... Yeah, because when your hand's on in the back, the wood's pulling up. Right, right. And the saw cuts the third faster. Yeah. It's not binding on you. Yeah. Right, and yeah. And the other way, oh boy. <laughs> so what about it. then with the drag saws? Say you guys were used to working with drag saws like you were 50 years ago. Couple and hours. this tree here, about how long? Couple hours. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, several hours. Yeah. And, and incidentally, these are the pollen wedges we're talking about. About of course, now if we had to wedge it when we had the drag saw, it would still maybe took us about four or five hours. Oh, I'm sure. We still got to saw the back end with the drag saw. Sure. Right. 
Right. And uh, if you had to wait, it would have changed off. Of course, we got jacks nowadays. That's, I got a couple of jacks up at the house. I jack this over yeah. in 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Still yeah, yeah. Uh, when you talk about using steel to put a tree over, why, you got a combination of things here. Uh, you have, you use plates here uh, for your wedges, and you, you put these in. In other words, when you your saw mark, you push these in, and then you get your wedge started in between these, like so, and this is in the tree, and then, I mean, you just keep on beating on them, and you use uh, sometimes... Uh, You'll use, yeah, always use shims with your wedges. Uh, that way they drive easier and don't sink in the, and, uh, don't sink in the wood so much. And uh, sometimes you use, well, uh, we've used, we've used a, a dozen or two sometimes yeah. on big trees. But you always with the shims, your, your wedges and shims. And that's the uh, way you do it. And thin, those thin wedges is useless in wood without shims. Oh, yeah, right, right, yeah. So... Yeah, in fact, the matter is, I can remember sometimes we even used to squirt a little oil on them as we yeah. started, you know? Yeah. Well, I was telling, I was telling all about sometimes they're a little cantankerous, and I can remember a few times my dad and I, we started, on a, if they get flooded laying on the side, we used to take it off the tree sometime and get it started, and then we'd hang it up there. <laughs> But this is all painted nice. It ought to run good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Jack, Nell, and Oral Sons, Rex and Rick, are falling this big redwood tree on the Whitlow Ranch near McCann, California. On a tree this size, the four horsepower 1944 Hanson drag saw would be much faster than hand falling. Mel's father called this strap the rubber man. The rubber man, often an old inner tube, kept tension on the blade allowing one man operation once the saw was hung. Note the steel peg which has been driven into the tree to support the saw.
Brogan? Yeah. We're going to set it off a second. Yeah. I think it, we probably could. Okay, and I... And this is, uh, yeah, it's a little spark thing here. Okay. And uh, anyway, yeah, this is a, this is, this is first saw that uh, my dad and I had when I was little. My job was to pack water to the darn thing. It uh, used a lot of, used a lot of water. And uh, a little tough packing around from log to log, but once it got there, why well, it was, it better was beat the hand saw. Oh, that, son? Huh? What kind of saw is that? Vaughn. Yeah, this is the Vaughn. They're made in Washington. And uh, we had, uh, we got one, we got one at home that's uh, was patented in 1915, and it didn't even have a clutch. One guy had hold it up out of the wood while the other guy started it. So I got three models of Vaughn's, and they ca they've came a long way, but even a long way wasn't all that good. <laughs> Mel Bird made the cover of Bailey's Woodsman Supplies catalog in the 1988 spring issue. Quoting from Bill Bailey's introduction, I've known Mel Bird for some 15 years now, and he stands out in my mind as one of the most memorable characters I've met. At 57, he's still vibrant and full of ideas and plans. I'd guess at birth, he was wound a little tighter than the rest of us, end quote. Mel probably inherited these traits from his parents, who could be described as ambitious, hardworking, and always looking for a new challenge. In 1930, they moved to Eugene, Oregon, where Mel was born on March 31, 1931. Mel, the youngest by 10 years, had three sisters and a brother. This photo, taken when Mel was about one year old, shows him sitting on a tree stump. The photo may have been prophetic because Mel has been sitting or standing on stumps most of his life. In 1935, when Mel was four, the family moved to Berkeley, California. How you doing, Al? How's everything? Oh, it's going along, I guess. Pretty yeah. Smart. I sure uh, like the looks of your new Chevrolet. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, I got that, uh, that's my wife, uh, Carlene's uh, little town car, which that reminds me uh, about Chevys have come a long ways. Uh, this is what we came to California in, was the 1929 Chevy. And uh, we, uh, you know, back in the 30s, you know, things weren't always all that well. And they, a lot of time, maybe haven't even improved in today's times. But uh, we uh, moved to California. Uh, my dad had a job in, uh, well, in, uh, in Oakland. And uh, he was going to go to work for Southern Pacific uh, uh, as a painting. And uh, anyway, uh, he, he rebuilt a 1929 Chevrolet panel livery, and we built, and he built a, uh, uh, a trailer. And that we, was in Oregon? Yeah, in Oregon. We left Eugene, Oregon. Eugene. Yeah, we left Eugene, Oregon, where we lived there. And I was four years old at the time. This was 1935. And uh, we, uh, <clears throat> he built this, you might say it was probably one of the first uh, mobile homes that he uh, built himself on the chassis of this 1929 Chevrolet. And in doing so, he, uh, he left the, the emergency brake sticking up through the floorboards, and, uh, or the, 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 say the floor of the trailer that he built. And uh, we had a little bench on each side there up in the front, and a little table folded out of the wall, and you'd fold the table up, and the brake was right there. And they had a, uh, a doorbell system there from an old house. You know, you press a little button and had a little uh, dry cell six volt battery. And little, he had a, a signal system of to pull a brake on hard or let it off or, or just ease it on. And pull it on hard was when his brakes got too hot. Uh, they weren't holding much and he'd let his clear off and then my brother, he'd pull that clear on and, and the uh, and let his cool, and then he'd press a button so that he'd take over again. And the old, the old they were uh, they were mechanical brakes, and the old Chevrolets in they had no front wheel brakes. They were just all rear wheels. So the, your foot pedal brake and your emergency brakes is all one, you know. And so uh, anyway, it was a quite a it was a quite a uh, required somebody riding in the back end. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So all my brothers and sisters uh, rode in the trailer, and I rode up front with my folks, and uh, had everything loaded down heavily. And so the old uh, 101 highway, uh, we'll say we'll say 50% of it was just gravel road in 1935. 
and a lot of ups and downs, a lot of adverse. And, and, and with the adverse, we carried a 10-gallon uh, cream can full of water, and he'd have to pull over and stop every once in a while and uh, the, uh, add a little water to the radiator. And we had them, they didn't have much for tires in, so. Uh, well, I was going to ask you, uh, did you patch any tires coming down? Oh. Uh -huh. Had any flat tires? Oh, yeah. And, you know, back then, you know, the, uh, they, they even had boots and stuff, which were popular. You get a, if you got a rock thing in there, you didn't take it to the gas station and get a vulcanized deal. You just oh. put a boot in it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I it, remember that. That was a necessity. Uh, at least two two spare tires and a couple of inner tubes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Any place very right. If you did any amount of traveling, why, you carry extra tires and tire patching and boots yeah. and all that sort of thing. They moved across the bay to San Francisco the following year, both parents working at the Del Monte Cannery for some time. His parents started buying and moving into rundown houses, refurbishing them in their spare time, selling at a profit, and then buying another. Mel started delivering papers after school, eventually delivering to some 400 subscribers. The paper here reminds me a little bit, you know, when I was a kid, I used, used to deliver. to sell papers. Yeah, I, papers? I delivered papers there in San Francisco. and. And anyway, uh, we, uh, I finally got a route up to about 400 papers, and uh, it was kind of interesting. Uh, the, the collecting part was the interesting thing here. We, uh, uh, it took uh, sometimes as much work or more work uh, collecting as it did delivering. Oh, I bet it did. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, a lot of the doggone people, you know, they kind of put you off from time to time. And I found out that I, uh, I got to arguing with the customers and everything about when I'd been there and all. And so I bought a little dollar watch. And I'd take my receipt book. And when they, if they didn't pay, I'd write number one, two, three, four, however many times I'd been there. And I'd write the time and the date on the deal there. And so that way, then, when they'd, they would say, well, come back and whatever, I could turn this thing over. And I'd tell them, hey, look how many times I've been here, you know? Remind and them. Remind them. I'd say, yeah, hey, I've been, been here a few times before, and I'm, I'd like to get paid now. <laughs> and if they didn't pay after the, the, the fifth time, then I'd, uh, on the, from the fifth time on, I'd go from 10 to midnight, and I'd press the doorbell, and I'd sometimes get people up, and they'd, they'd wonder and say, well, hey, you know, don't you know what time it is? And I'd say, yeah, I know what time it is. And I said, and I'd show them how many times I'd been there, and I'd like to get paid. Yeah. And uh, most generally, I'd get paid. And uh, the thing is there, I said, hey, I darn sure know what time it is, so I got to go to school in the morning, you know? And uh, the sad part of the, uh, the paper business there with the paper kids, is the paper company, they have a certain, they, they pull their money off the top. So this means the paper boy has what's left. And if he don't collect it, he don't get it. He don't get it. No, right. uh, the, uh, the, so the paper boy eats all the bad bills. How sad. In 1946, the family bought a house on 10 acres near Sebastopol, California, growing apples and cherries and raising chickens. Then in 1947, they bought 160 acres near Ukiah, California, at Orr Springs. Mel's dad stayed at Orr Springs, making split stuff from redwood timber on the property. The rest of the family remained in Sebastopol. But Mel spent most weekends and vacations at Orr Springs, helping his father make split stuff, which of course included falling the trees, with hand saws and drag saws at first. Well, here we are at the uh, <clears throat> Blue Ox on a rainy day here. And uh, here's a 22-foot uh, hand saw that uh, we brought up. Uh, it used to be over the bar there in the saw blade for many years. Uh, I, when I was 14 years old, I worked with my dad probably along about 1944, and we were working, and we fell on approximate 20-foot uh, uh, redwood. And uh, this saw a lot of times they refer to as a Swede spittle uh, or misery whip, and which uh, both of them uh, cover the uh, description very well. And back then, uh, people ask, uh, this is what they use. It's all we had to use was uh, hand saws and axes, for them, particularly on the big trees. Mel graduated from Sebastopol High School in 1949, sold his car, bought a Jeep, and moved to Orr Springs. In mid-1950, they bought 160 acres at Whitethorn, near Shelter Cove, California, selling the Sebastopol and Orr Springs property after building a house at Whitethorn. Mel was 19 when he built a log house for his new bride, a high school sweetheart. This photo was taken about 25 years later when the abandoned house had deteriorated. 
Well, uh, as, uh, as time drew on with myself, I graduated from high school and, and, uh, and I got on my own. I, and I married a, uh, a girl that I went to high school with and uh, uh, built my first log cabin there and, uh, out in the White Thorn area and we built it on buying 200 acres of ground out there. And I built the cabin uh, all out of everything from the woods. I made myself, I made the shakes and everything. And the only thing that, was, uh, that wasn't uh, hand split or, or hand hewed out of the woods was the, uh, the floor itself, which I uh, salvaged some lumber out of another old cabin. It was a few miles off. Anyway, as uh, time went on, my little bride, she wanted to go to the city and live like normal people. And uh, that was about six months or so later. And, and uh, anyway, it was hard for me to understand. I thought I, this was uh, we were really styling there. I had uh, two, two um, five-gallon uh, crocs there, uh, uh, old pickle crocs. One of them had a little spigot in it right there by the sink. So when I come home at night, I packed the water in and I cut wood and put that in a wood box and I filled all the gas and kerosene lights. And, and even I, I even bought her a brand new gasoline iron and uh, had a nice holo old holocraft radio with a, an old dry cell battery and I climbed a tree and topped it and put an aerial in it and, and uh, I thought that I thought this was I thought we were just living really fine but as time went before two years were up I, we uh, finally took her back down to her dad's and so she could live like normal people and uh, as far as I was concerned I stayed in the woods and, and I and I and at this point I haven't left it and I'm, this is, uh, to me, that was the best life, rather than the hustle and the bustle of a city somewhere. And the other thing about it is that, uh, like my dad said, we have a picnic lunch in the, in, the, in the woods every day. People in the cities, they wait all year long, and maybe get to spend a few days and uh, have a little camp out and a little picnic lunch, and we have that, we have that every day. In 1953, they built and opened a grocery store on property they had purchased near Phillipsville on the old 101 highway. After delivering a load of split stuff, Mel would haul fruit and vegetables on the return trip. They closed the store in 1961 after the new 101 freeway bypassed Phillipsville. Mel started falling timber full time in 1954. He continued making split stuff with his father in the winter and did so until the demand dropped off drastically in the early 60s. What's that? How wide a piece could you split by this method? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You look at the grain, and, you, and if it's pretty flat and it starts to go too much, well, then you, you make shorter, you know, you can go as wide as the, the grain looks like will permit. Yeah. And then you divide your, uh, you divide your strain here. So at this point, I, we'll, we'll figure this is like one, two, three, four boards. take a fro and then you just go every two inches and you got grape stakes. Then you sharpen them of course. Now this first shake here, I don't it's been a long time, but we'll give it a little try here. And I see here where I've got a gonna back up here. This I'm a little too close to that. But anyway these uh, what you call they just they ride right out. Okay and as I was saying See the first one, will, it'll feather out. Now the rest of them, they should, uh, they should just, they should just go right on through. And these are like, we'll say, an approximate quarter-inch shake. And these are what they call, used to call, they're a vertical shake, and they're. they're 
commonly referred to as uh, the old barn shake. On almost all the barns that you see around the country, shake barns, this is what they're this is this is what they're made of. A three foot shake, approximately six inches wide, and uh, three feet long, about six inches wide, and uh, and uh, we'll say a, a, approximately a quarter of an inch thick. When they put them on a the roof, this is how they put them on. You got two layers of shake. Yeah. Yeah, this is, and that's, that's what you got when you get through. That's your roof. That's, uh, like I say, the old barn shakes. And again, and, and also, in making these things, you always keep them just exactly the way they split off. And that way then they, otherwise that way they match and they make a nice bundle in. You know, when you get through, when you get through, why then you get 25 of these in a bundle and then you just put a piece of bell wire around each end, twist it up and, and there you are. But you don't just split them and throw them in a pile and then try to put them back together. The idea of the thing is you've got your knee up there and go bump, 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 and you leave them just the way they come off the block. And like I say, uh, normally, now this isn't so hot. We always used to like to uh, cut a nice green oak and got some weight. This is all dried out. This is one of my dad's old uh, mallets that he made, and it's been hanging around for years, and it's getting about light as cork now, so it's not really a good beating tool. You want a nice green oak so it's got some weight. When you hit it, you go poof. You just hit one lick, and the pro goes into the wood. You don't stand there and beat on it, but like I've been doing with this. In 1998, Mel is 67 years old, and his clock is still apparently wound a little tighter than most of us. One endeavor at a time never seems to be enough of a challenge for Mel, however. During the winter of 1969, he and his father, now 79 years old, remodeled the old store and reopened it in 1970 as a tavern and logging museum. He operated the Sawblade Tavern for two decades, hiring a manager during the logging season as he was out in the woods falling trees. Mel is a very good timber cutter, but is also a chainsaw carving artist. While not his first effort, the 16-foot giant of the avenue is by far the largest. Mel gave it that name because it stood along the stretch of the Redwood Highway called the Avenue of the Giants. He carved many artifacts during the 1970s, selling them uh, not only at his own shop in Phillipsville, but also in other locations, such as San Francisco and Virginia City, Nevada. Mel sold the Sawblade Tavern in 1991. He and his wife, Carlene, live in a remote part of Humboldt County, California. They have indoor plumbing, their own electric power plant, and a good wood heater.
anyway, this is, uh, what can I say, one of the neatest little splitters that, uh, it was a homemade from an old friend of mine, and I did a little remodeling on it. And in essence, we, particularly us folks out here in the hills, we all burn firewood, so uh, the, the easiest and the quickest way to make it is, is the most unique and, and the most desirable. And other than that, why I do uh, sell a little firewood. And in order to sell firewood, well, you got to go with the least amount of handling and the least amount of energy because uh, there's not that much money in it. And so if you if you hustle, uh, well, you can make you can make a good living at it. And I dabble in it from time to time. And normally, uh, either have your truck backed up here and throw the wood in it, or I have a little loader here that I put the bucket on, and I, I fill the bucket, and, I, and I've got a little gauge there, I put a quarter of a cord in it, and I've got a flatbed dump truck, and, and I put four buckets full in there, and I've got a cord, and it's measured, and if somebody wants to buy it, well, we got a cord of wood, or two cord, or two and a half, uh, whatever's uh, required at the time. So I guess that's about it. He also owns a portable sawmill. Well, uh, this is a little something else that goes along with the hills. Uh, this is probably, this is kind of the, one of the latest little uh, portable mills out, a little Lucas mill, which I bought from my old friend uh, Bill Bailey down at Laytonville. And it does very fine work, uh, nice dimensional lumber, uh, and it's so portable that I haul this whole mill uh, on my little uh, Campbell Suburban there, sitting behind me here. This is Mel's mill in action, cutting precision lumber on the neighbor's ranch. Mel's wife, Carlene, keeps busy, too. These are her Mr. and Mrs. Lauder dolls. In 1998, Lars was 78 years old and still falling trees. Well, anyway, I better get this tree down. I'm going to start in by the undercut. I'm, I'm ready to put the undercut in here. And the reason for an undercut is to, it uh, keeps the tree from cracking, breaking, splitting when we fall it, and also it guides where the tree will go. We always have a certain place we want that tree to go. And I'm going to check this undercut with my double bit axe, too, just to be sure that it's accurate. I got the sights on the saw here, but they're not really that accurate. Tuffy's got to help, and he thinks the most the way to help is to start barking. And after a tree is down, he chews on the bark and the limbs. Barking actually didn't he work. That tree would be down and bucked up by now. Right. He thinks he could have helped, and he is a good help. 
No, I don't. Now you're starting to chew on the stuff now, yeah? Yeah. Now I'm going to check it to my double bit axe. Actually, this works like a carpenter square. When they're building a the house, they put the square on the corner of the house to see that it's it's the square like they want it. And this does the same thing. And I can use it as sight. It looks good. I check it once more for side lean. It tells me which side of the stump I gotta hold the most wood to keep it from going wrong. The lean is that way a little bit, and I'm safer over on this side. So we try and get, keep our saw over on the opposite side of the lean. I need it. That's it. That's it. Come on. Atta boy. That's a good boy. What a good dog. Yeah, what a good dog. Thank you, Tuffy. I need some gasoline, too. Go get my gas jugs. Hurry up. I gotta put some gas in this saw. Come on, hurry up. Bring my gas jugs. That's it. Come on. hydraulic jack nowadays instead of steel wedges and a sledgehammer it's a lot easier to put a tree up the hill where you want them than hammering them with a wedge, wedge and a hammer when little trees are in my way I like to cut them but when they absolutely aren't, aren't dangerous well I just try and trim them up so that the tree is left here In fact, when I was out in the woods with my dad, when I was a little guy, he said, always try to leave a tree in this place that one, one you cut. And that's what I've always tried to do. You sure think you got a bark where the tree will go. Yeah, it sounds like she's challenging those trees. Right? Yeah. Oh, Tuffy, now, you, you're barking right in my ear. knock the undercut out and check it with my other axe. Watch it, Tuffy. That looks good.
Come here, Cuffy. Come here. Come here. Time to go home. Did you catch that? What? Time to go home? I got that. <laughs> Look at there. He's ready. He knew what I said. Lars and Rena, his wife of 52 years, live in Murphy's, a small town located in the foothills of California's Sierra Nevada mountains. Lars taught two of their sons the art of falling timber. Ross is on the left, Forrest on the right. I was doing some limbing one morning, and I had never used a single bit axe like this before. I always used a double bit axe. But this one was sharper than my other axe, so I decided to try it. And I think I didn't quite get the balance of it because I was living on a, on a, log, on a limb down on the side of the log, and I missed somehow and got, came right down through my foot and cut four of my toes off. And I had to get a hold of my partner and, and get him up there and help me up to the pickup, and then we had to drive into Fortuna to the medical station there. And I was actually, I was without, I was off of work for 13 months that time. But I, and it was a little tough going back to work too because that toe, was, it really did, I really did miss that big toe. It was, it was gone. Call any close calls now and in the woods years ago? Oh, I assume well, you do, I do. Well, oh, you bet. I, we both had a lot of them, and, and personally, with the cold, close calls, we're still even both here. Yeah. We're buried. That's we're quite both, fortunate. With, with both hands. Yeah. Both legs, pretty neat. Both yeah, we're still able to hobble around. I consider myself probably the luckiest one in the, who ever walked out of the woods. Well, and I do too. One of Laurel's close calls occurred in 1962 when a large fir tree fell on his D7 caterpillar while he was operating it. The tree hit three or four feet ahead of oil, driving the engine down into the pan and breaking numerous expensive cat parts. The tree then bounced forward, coming to rest as shown. Oil patched it up right. and went back to logging, fixing it properly during the winter shutdown. This is the same D7 in 1998. Oil is working on the layout for the redwood tree which the crew fell with the drag saw. Jr., his sons, and their ancestors have worked this property since 1867, harvesting timber and running a cattle and sheep ranch. Well, actually, hungry coyotes convinced them that they should get out of the sheep business. They have maintained healthy and productive forest and ranch land, and incredible as it may seem, have done it without the benefit of enlightened guidance from any club, society, or bureaucrat. They have accomplished this because they love, respect, and know their land. While redwood trees do grow from seeds, they also have an ability to regenerate themselves by another means. When a redwood falls or is cut down, new trees regularly sprout around their trunks. This is one of the trees that was cut on the Union Lumber Company's contract in 1919 through 21. All the big redwood, the old growth redwood, was taken off of this place. I say all of it. 75 to 80 percent of it was taken. Made into split stuff. Railroad ties, basically, were hauled to the rail and sold. This timber, this land, 
has yielded three crops. Three crops have left this land. And you can see what's here. There's already another crop here now. Uh, this, this stuff right here was cut in 1959. These were three trees growing here. One taking in 59, and that stump there was taken in about 75, 1975. The third tree standing was very, very small. Today it is bigger than any one of these three trees, so if you cut one at a time and let the little ones grow, that should prove the point. You know, it, it could have been maybe that high. Oh, yeah, probably, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was, yeah. it was, it was a yeah. bush, not a tree. Yeah. Now, this is a good example of sustained yield. Sustained yield yeah. is the situation. That's the truth. If you don't take care of your forest, you won't have any. And as right. if you swing that camera around and show this area here that now has timber in it, when we were here in in 69, uh, 59, those trees aren't there. Well, even, uh, like I say, it's a position, just go right around up. Yeah, there yeah. it is. Yeah. That's a nice little tree. Yes, it is. Go get through there. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in other words, uh, it's kind of like somebody that's been here that appreciates what he's got. Right. He appreciates you the God darn you land. Yeah. You know? You take care of it. Yeah, you bet. And uh, I yeah. say, uh, has a quite a compliment coming. Right. This, this piece of land yeah. will, you can survive on it if you take care of it. Yeah. If you don't take care of it, and if you cut it all at once, yeah. pretty soon you don't have anything. You got about two generations before you could even. Yeah. Right. Well, it's like, it's like slaughtering all your cattle at one time, you yeah. know, whatever. You got to yeah. take some and leave some. That's yeah. life. I was up on Highway 4 above Arnold, up, pretty near up to Cottage Springs, and uh, was cutting some, I was falling timber for a guy that had a contract with the Forest Service to fall salvage trees, the ones that were dying, dead or dying, and we were getting them out and getting them to the mill while they were still good so we could make lumber out of right. them. Right. Or make peelers, make plywood out of them. And this was early in the morning after, it was uh, about in November, after the regular logging had shut down, well, I was always available to help if there was any place I could make a few dollars. So I was cutting timber for this salvage operator. And it was early in the morning. I had just felled this tree. It wasn't very far from the road. It wasn't over 50 feet off the road, but I fell it parallel to the highway. And uh, I had just fell it, and I started to limb it and buck it, and I saw a car stop out on the road. And two people got out, a man and a woman. I imagine they were married. I don't know. I didn't ask them. But they were elderly. And that woman just came stalking right up to me, just boom, 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 like that. And I knew it was going to happen because I'd caught heck about cutting timber before. So I shut off my saw and sat down on the log. And she stalked right up to me within three or four feet. And she said, what do you mean ruining our timber like this? She said, I think it's terrible. She said, I, I, just, I, I just hate to have you people cutting this timber. And I said, well, lady, when she finally stopped talking, I said, well, lady, this tree is just about dead. There's a few green limbs on it, but it's all, it'll soon be dead, and right now we can salvage it and get it to the mill and saw it and to be sawed into lumber that can be used. Well, she said, I just, I just think it's terrible the way you're ruining our timber, cutting it. And when she stopped again, and so I could say anything, I, I said, well, lady, this tree could have fell across the highway when it, di when it got dead and could have killed somebody, hurt somebody. Ah, uh, she said, that don't make any difference. She was just madder than heck, you know. So next time I had a chance to say anything, I said, well, lady, where do you live? She said, I live right down here in Blue Lake Springs, subdivision. And I said, well, don't you live in a house made of wood? Yes, she said, I do. But we got our lumber in stock. <laughs> Timber is 
the base of our economy. Look a little closer and you will see. Everything is tied to this industry and it does affect you and me. A resource that we can't do without. It used to be abused without a doubt. It's a renewable resource too and that's just what we intend to do. There are many things that you would miss, too many things to try to list. If fanatic groups will have their way, then the whole economy will pay. If you're a part of this industry, or if you've never even seen a tree, you'll be affected by what is done, and so will everyone. They want us not in the woods, you see, and they want not to harvest the old growth tree. They'd rather see it rotten to eternity than to use it for the good of humanity. It doesn't make sense to a thinking man. It's a hard thing to understand. Why let it rot and fall to the ground? It should have been logged when it was sound. If fanatic groups will have their way, then the whole economy will pay. No new guitars or fiddles to play, no new homes for people to stay, no new books to read or write, no fire in the stove to keep it warm at night. There'll be no paper for a dollar bill, no finish wood for a windowsill, take away the pay of a million men, and no new forest to grow again. There are many things that you would miss, too many things to try to list. If fanatic groups will have their way, then the whole economy will pay. No new guitars or fiddles to play, no new homes for people to stay, no new books to read or write, no fire in the stove to keep it warm at night. There be no paper for a dollar bill, no finish wood for a windowsill. Take away the pay of a million men, and no new force to grow again. And no new force to grow again. And no new force to grow again.